Welcome to the IREL Podcast. Are you sick and tired of real estate gurus pitching their next free construction deal only to find out years later they were completely wrong? Worried the next overseas conference you spend thousands to attend will only be used to sell overpriced lots and deserted developments? Join thousands of other international real estate seekers who are looking for their place in paradise without the sales pitch. Straight from your host, Taylor White. Hey, podcast listener. Welcome to the Overseas Property Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor White. In just a few moments from now, you'll be hearing about an incredible resource that has been involved in the mortgage business for 30-something years and knows a thing or two about home financing. Mortgage financing is her thing and connecting my listener base in over 70 countries with your real estate is mine. If you're a homeowner, agent, or developer, and you want to showcase your properties to my worldwide audience, then you should listen up. As host of the number one ranked overseas real estate podcast in iTunes that has been downloaded thousands of times by listeners in over 70 countries, they all have one thing in common, an interest in seeing your overseas property listings. Head on over to irelpodcast.com forward slash list and get started today. I'm excited to bring you one of my personal favorite episodes when I sit down and speak with Ellen Davis from Mortgage Link Home and as someone who's been rated one of Maryland's top five mortgage lenders by Lender411, named one of the leading mortgage brokers in the U.S. by Goldline Research and Forbes Magazine, and has an amazing energy and vibe that makes her passion contagious. Stick around and listen to Ellen, and you will learn why she believes the key to mortgage financing today is being creative and reveals just how you can do that to score your next deal. Uncovers exactly what documentation you will need to get in order when submitting your next loan and reconfirms this isn't 2003 any longer. Looks into her crystal ball and predicts the future, but unfortunately, you might not like what you hear. Wait! Did she or didn't she confirm her famous New York real estate reality show connections? Schwing and much more. I'm too excited. Let's join Ellen from the Mortgage Link Home Headquarters in Maryland. Ellen, what's going on? It's Taylor White. I'm excited to have you on the podcast today, straight from Maryland. So we can get to know you personally. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, Taylor, it's wonderful to be on this call, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity. What can I tell you about me? Let's say I have two fantastic kids, a great dog. I'm married forever. You know, it's a lovely area to be in. Uh, we're in the metro D.C. area in Maryland, Washington, D.C., northern Virginia. We're in this fantastic location in the capital of the United States, and we have access to so much. I'm a soccer mom. That's that's a big thing. And my clients throughout the years have, luckily, a lot of them have become very close friends that we consider family even. And um, that's the most that I can tell you about who I am personally. Uh, Ellen, great I life, love great it. kids. <laughs> So Ellen, I love it and I love your energy. And I know that you've been involved in the mortgage and insurance business for something around 30 years or so. Can you talk more about yourself professionally? Yes, you're being very kind, Taylor. Uh, yes, right. I have been in both the mortgage and insurance industry for 30 years now. And uh, I, I do love to joke around that I was only one when I started and I'm not older than 29. But if anybody <laughs> the math, well, you know that, well, you, you just know what I'm saying at this point. So I think one of the pieces that has kept me so involved in these two very specific industries is I actually love what I do. More so, the, the, the most important thing that I love doing is speaking with my clients, educating my clients. If I could do that all day long, every day, and in a way I have been for the last 30 years, uh, I've, been, I, I've been lucky enough to stay in 
two industries that people come in and out of. And I've been able to maintain very successful relationships, very successful businesses. And truthfully, it comes down to I actually love what I do. Uh, and I hope to continue to do it for another 30 years. I'm trying to convince my children to, you know, want to do this as well. But they're still young and they're more interested in becoming soccer stars or computer programmers at the moment. So, <laughs> As a kid, who doesn't want to be a soccer star, right? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, Ellen, we're talking about mortgage options today. But before we begin, which states are you licensed in or can do mortgage loans? Well, I'm personally licensed in Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. My company is licensed in many other states. We're licensed in Colorado, Delaware, of course, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, South Carolina is pending, by the way, Pennsylvania, oh, uh, Virginia, and we're looking at some other states. So we are a full service mortgage lender. Everything we do is in-house. We deal with common sense underwriting. We are dealing with individuals. Now, we might be dealing with groups of individuals at the same time, but their needs, their wants, and their desires are what we focus on. We're not just looking at a guideline that says we need X, Y, and Z, and if we don't have it, we're not going to do it. We're actually going to know the people that we're doing business with. And then, of course, with our call today, Ellen, the things that we're talking about will work in all 50 states. So we're not going to talk about rates and those kinds of things, but just the tips and strategies will work everywhere, right? That is correct. Absolutely. And in some cases, Taylor, they, they will also, because I understand that your listenership is you know worldwide. Correct. Some of these tips and strategies, depending on the rules and regulations of that community and that country, they actually work for some of your uh, listeners overseas. So, Ellen, let's jump into it. Today's mortgage landscape is much different than it was, say, seven years ago. And I know being creative is very important. Can you talk more about tips about being creative? Oh, you know, uh, this is probably my favorite topic. Uh, years ago, and you're right, seven years is a very different world than what we have today. Uh, truthfully, five years and two years. And even last year, things are different. And over 30 years we have become creative. We've had to. Guidelines, regulations dictate that. So being creative, how do you buy a home today? How do you refinance a home today? How do you find the money to purchase additional properties, perhaps a vacation home or investment properties? How do you utilize the money or the equity or the estate that you've created to build that life, that dream that you've always thought about. Some of the traditional methods that are available, as well as some of the ones that aren't so traditional. Of course, traditionally, going through a mortgage lender like myself, and of course, I want everybody to utilize us uh, because my company is the best thing since sliced bread. Going through that process today is very different than what it was. Today, we require a tremendous amount of documentation and we need to know all pieces of information. We have to go from point A to point B. And so in that regard, we still have to follow certain guidelines. But again, we're going to look at that individual. What we try to do is go through everything up front because, as I said, an individual... It may be a group of individuals. It could be one person. Every single loan, doesn't matter if the loan has the same loan amount. It doesn't matter if the purchase price is the same. But every single loan is like a fingerprint. No two loans in the last 30 years that I have done have been the same because everybody is different. So even going through the traditional process of getting a loan to purchase a home, be it your primary or owner-occupied home or a vacation home or an investment property is the same. We're going to get as much information up front, talk about it, set up a plan, look for any potential 
yellow flags. Let's deal with them up front. So from the time that we put information in till it comes out, it's smooth sailing. That is our goal. Please ask a question. <laughs> okay, perfect. I got started in 2001, and this was right when we had all the creative awesome loans as far as zero down, no income, no doc, pay option arm loans. Basically, if you could breathe and you could <laughs> sign, at some point you could get a loan through somebody. But maybe talk about some of the documentation that most people would need to get any kind of loan, whether it's to buy a house for the first time, whether it's for a home line of credit, any kind of loan, what are some of the normal documentation that people need today? Well, today, and you're right, years ago, if you breathe, you could have a loan. And today, it's very different. So if you are a W-2 employee, last two years of W-2s and your tax returns, if you own a business, then it's not only your tax returns and 1099s if you're a sole proprietor or K-1s, it's also your corporate tax returns for the last two years, pay stubs for the last 30 days, bank statements for the last 60 days. And this one I want to stop at, at a moment. It, it's not just, oh, here's my summary page of my checking, savings, and money market or brokerage account. We actually need the full statement. So if the statement has 10 pages, even if some of them are blank or just have legalese on them, we need every document, every page, copy of your driver's license, uh, homeowner's insurance information, current mortgage statement if you're doing a refinance so that we can order the proper payoff, things like that. Those are the basics. Now, from that, as we review it, there are almost always questions. So here's the basic guideline. In your bank account, if you have a deposit that is greater than $1,000, that is not a direct deposit, and a direct deposit can be from your employer, from a tax return thing, or, or a tax refund, that's fine. But if you go to the bank and deposit one check or any number of checks because it was uh, your birthday or a holiday or you did a job for somebody and somebody just paid you for it, well, we're going to need a letter of explanation for anything that is a deposit greater than $1,000 because we have to follow the money nowadays. Does that help a bit? That does help a bit, and that's a lot more documentation than it was 7 to 10 <laughs> years ago, Ellen. It, it most definitely was. Um, in the years of no doc or stated income, we didn't need tax returns uh, unless – you owned a business, and then there were some documents we needed, but uh, we didn't need pay stubs. Sometimes we didn't need bank statements. Sometimes we only needed a copy of your driver's license and maybe one other or three other documents with not too many letters of explanation. Now I tell my clients, you know, be prepared and let's prepare ahead of time. Let's not wait till it's gone through underwriting and then we have a potential problem. Let's deal with the problems in the beginning. And I think that is where the most creative piece of what we do nowadays comes into play. If you are talking with a mortgage lender, who really cares about what you're trying to accomplish, they're going to take the time up front. They're going to see this stuff. They're going to talk with you. They're going to make sure everybody is on the same page with you so that you can achieve your financial goals. And that is more important than anything else. So Ellen, we have an overseas real estate podcast, and I recently spoke with Tim Lucas from My Mortgage Insider about great mortgage refinance options to get the cash together to buy overseas. Can you go over some great refinance options, whether on a primary residence or an investment or a vacation rental? Sure, absolutely. And that's fun to do because I actually have had clients throughout the years who have utilized some of these available options to do just that. And so one of the things you can do when you own, and let's talk about your primary residence. If you've been there a while and you've created some equity in the home, rates today are absolutely amazing. We're not going to talk about specifics, but 
rates are absolutely amazing today. They are still at historic lows. So potentially doing a refinance, a traditional refinance and taking cash out of your existing home to utilize that to buy a vacation home or an investment property overseas is one way of doing it. Another way is, again, in your primary home, if there's equity, taking a home equity line of credit or what's called a HELOC or a home equity loan or a HE loan and doing a very similar thing. But that then puts a second mortgage on there. The nice thing about HELOCs are if you take out X dollars but only use Y, you're only paying back on the Y amount. So you have some maneuverability. Now, over the years, some new products have come out, one of which, and, and this talks more toward the clientele that is heading toward retirement age or quite possibly are in their retirement years, a reverse mortgage. There are pros and cons to everything, and as long as you are fully educated as to what you are doing, doing a reverse mortgage to take that large amount of equity because you want to spend part of the year in France or in the Caribbean or in Mexico or in Thailand and you want to buy a property that you can do that, this might be a great opportunity for those that meet the guidelines. Now, those are pretty traditional routes and there are some non-traditional routes that people can also utilize. Of course, cash on hand. And what does that mean? Have you saved enough? Is there a large amount of money sitting in a savings account receiving almost no interest? Could you utilize that? Absolutely. Other ways of finding quote unquote cash on hand, perhaps you have some investment properties and you don't want to manage them. Well, maybe it's time to take a look at selling them and utilizing the funds in potentially a 1035 exchange so that you can uh, um, change your tax needs for your benefits. That's another way of doing it. Some additional ways, and this is great, again, if there's the opportunity where parents might lend the money to their children. Now, there are some estate and tax issues, and I always tell people, talk to your estate planner, talk to your tax accountant. But if it's done correctly and there are legal documents drawn up and some level of interest, even if it's below market, well, then the IRS in the United States doesn't see this as a gift because you're taking a loan. This might be a great opportunity for a parent who has an estate that they would like to utilize to help the children grow into a larger estate of their own. Another way, and this has been popular throughout the years, sometimes more than others, but seller financing, where the seller actually finances the mortgage. For the seller, what a great opportunity. This is ongoing income for them potentially retirement income for them. They have somebody who purchases their home and, and truthfully, it's kind of a win-win. The person, the people or person who purchases the home, well, they have the home that they're looking for. The seller is bringing in income on a regular, consistent basis. And if something goes wrong and the buyers stop paying on that, well, the seller can foreclose on the property and take it back. And one other way, if I can throw one more out there, is if you have uh, security holdings and your brokerage allows, you can actually margin against your security holdings. And again, don't say this as a cross the board, go do this. Talk to your financial planner, talk to your accountant, talk to the people that you've put together as your team to help you create your financial plan. Don't do it in a vacuum. Bring in people that this is their expertise. You want to make sure that your taxes are taken care of properly, your financial plan is taken care of properly, that you have the ability to repay whatever loan or money you're utilizing, and you're not hurting yourself in the long run. 
with penalties and fees or anything like that. So these are just some of the things that people can do if, if available, if of interest, and if they meet those goals that they're looking to achieve. Ellen, this is a fantastic breakdown, and I wanted to ask you a question for myself because I'm in love with a, I guess it's a reality real estate show, and I want your opinion. So okay. it's based in New York City, and there's mm-hmm. three terrific real estate agents, and they deal with clients that have a lot of money. So we're not talking about houses or apartments for $300,000 or $500,000. We're talking about millions, $3 million, $5 million, $10 million. And it seems like all of their clients, their offers come in with all cash, and all cash is in quotes. Now, I'm assuming that their cash is probably not sitting in a checking or savings account. Where do you think their cash is coming from? Not how did they earn it, but where is it sitting and how can they access it? Well, <laughs> I, I'm only laughing. I don't know what Anybody who is on any of those shows, I may or may not know personally. So uh, this is just speculation. Perfect. Um, All cash can mean a lot of things. I'm going to go back to that margin against your security holdings. Right. Well, that's a cash position. Uh, You can take it as a cash position. And you're right. Is there money sitting in a savings account uh, acquiring 0.07%? Probably not, but the likelihood is that they have access to other financial vehicles, especially in those large dollar amounts. They may have a very good relationship with a brokerage house or with a direct bank that is doing specific wealth management for them and will extend a certain type of credit that is cash-like. Also, they may be utilizing, they may have sold property, or they have enough money coming in from rental properties that they're utilizing that. And on a monthly basis, I have actually seen that, where there's enough cash coming in that on a certain month, you know, monthly basis that they can utilize that money to purchase other properties. And then Ellen, I wanted to ask you about another option. It's not really financing, but it's a strategy to use with investment properties. Recently, I had on Jordan Shepard, who's the president of Checkbook IRA, where essentially you can do a self-directed 401k on an investment property. How many clients do you deal with that actually use that option? Well, I I have to tell you, Taylor, um, in the years, uh, and I would venture to say, I'd have to look at my records, but probably about two, possibly three years ago, I might have had one or two as they were starting to come more in vogue. I don't know that as many people understand the concept of it and how it benefits them or, or doesn't benefit them. I I would love to see something that is a little more widely used, and perhaps that's all about education and time. Most people, if you look at the United States and America, the American dream has always been, oh, let me buy the house. Let me live in that house. I'm going to take a 30-year mortgage, and in 30 years, when I make my last payment, I'm going to burn my mortgage payments. Okay, That's what our parents and our grandparents, that was their dream. In today's world, most people don't hold on to their mortgages greater than seven years, either because they've moved, we've had a refi boom, or they're they're taking money out to do other things. It could be college, it could be investments, it could be more real estate, it could be any number of things. So I don't know enough about it because I haven't utilized it often to help clients. So what you're saying is not very many clients of yours actually do that. No, no, not many. And then how many of your clients utilize a 1031 tax exchange? So we talked about a self-directed 401k, but how many utilize a 1031 tax exchange? Well, um, we utilize 1035 tax exchanges and we've seen more of those in the past than most recent, uh, which is interesting. I would venture to say, again, I'm going to go back, not this last year, but the prior years, 
investment wise, probably 15 or 20 percent as and and I'm going to go back even a little further as that uh, real estate bubble started to come up and there was a lot of equity automatically built into a property utilizing that 1035 exchange to purchase another property was I'm going to use the words again somewhat in vogue and back then I would venture to say probably 25 or 30 percent were utilizing that I'm seeing less of that in today's society uh, in today's world we are on an upswing in real estate values in most areas, in our area, let me put it that way, in the metro DC area, more so than in other areas. So we still have, there are still people that are underwater, meaning they owe more than the property is worth or they're even with it. So not as much in the last year, year and a half than I saw in prior years. Ellen, I wanted to ask you two more questions, if you don't mind, and then find out the best ways to follow and connect with you. Okay. What do you see coming down the line? You have a crystal ball, Ellen. I can tell you are <laughs> you are the sharpest of the sharp. You've been doing this for more or less 30 years. You have a crystal ball, Ellen Davis, and you are looking towards the future. Maybe it's a few days or a few weeks or a few months about the mortgage industry, whether rates going up or rates going down or things getting tougher or there's going to be more loans. What does your crystal ball say, Ellen Davis? Taylor, I want that crystal ball so bad <laughs> because I would, uh, if I had it and I knew where rates would be in an hour, I would be on some beautiful beach <laughs> with a drink in my hand with an umbrella. Are there things that the analysts say? Are there things that we can see based on history that we look for? Absolutely. Do we know that regulations and guidelines, though some have eased up, others have become more stringent? Absolutely. I, uh, this is more of a personal belief because I can't say overarching. I think we will see the ability to get a loan because we notice it now to be even more difficult down the road, at least for a period of time. Uh, and that's a purchase and or refinance. That is for the first time home buyer or the experienced home buyer. That is, it, it will be even more important for people who are self employed, sole proprietors, to show income and not have as many write offs. Things like that. I, I think we're going to see a tightening of guidelines. We clearly have seen a tightening of regulations and compliance over the years. Now, as to rates, uh, I don't think that we can maintain this just as if we could not maintain it years ago, and we're not supposed to. Rates aren't supposed to be this low for long periods of time. Rates are supposed to go up and down because they are tied into so many different financial vehicles to the stock market, to the bond market. So, you know, as a mortgage person, I, of course, want the bond market to be up, which would mean rates are lower, but that subsequently means that stocks are lower. Well, as a consumer, I want my stocks to be high. So it's really a double-edged sword. Now, I will tell you the one thing that I think we're really going to see in a very short period of time is 10 years ago, in 2003, 2004, we saw a tremendous amount of 30-year loans that had five and 10 year interest only pieces or arms within that loan. Okay. Now we are hitting that 10 year change where it's not the rate that is going to be necessarily the issue. It'll be that if the client, if the borrower had not utilized and paid some of their monthly payment toward principal, when that loan gets recast, it's getting recast to a 20-year amortization, which means they will now have a principal and interest payment that is a 
20-year amortization, not a 30-year. So if all they've been doing is paying interest only, lovely. Unfortunately, it's not going to be interest in principle based on a 30-year. It's going to be interest in principle based on a 20-year. And we potentially will see a tremendous amount of defaults occurring in the next year or so. And that is the one thing I am most nervous about for a lot of people. Ellen, fantastic chat today. We've only scratched the surface about this big industry known as the mortgage industry, but what might be some final tips or strategies that you might want to share with listeners that I didn't ask you? Um, most importantly, if you're thinking about purchasing anything, get pre-approved first. Go th and, and I don't mean pre-approved. Call somebody on the phone that you don't know, that you didn't get a recommendation from. Give them your social. Have them pull the, your credit. Don't do that. Find somebody that comes highly recommended. Have them actually sit down with you. Look at all of your income docs, all of your asset docs, and set up a plan and know exactly what you can afford, exactly what's going to meet and be within the goals and dreams that you have. Going out and finding that beautiful place that you fall in love with and putting a contract down on something and then finding out that you it's really just too expensive for you is not the way to go. Do it the right way up front. Take the time up front and, and build a team. Build that team that really cares about you and what your goals are. And that's probably my biggest thing I tell people. Talk to somebody. Know what's important. Know what you can afford to do. Get fully pre-approved. Go through some level of underwriting before you even go out so that you and the realtor, when you work together, you are really working together. And it's not a waste of time for you or the realtor. Ellen, I love your energy. I love your passion. I love your drive. Anybody who doesn't contact you is crazy. So what are the best ways to follow and connect with you? Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I think my parents would agree with you. Um, so some of the best ways to reach me is, of course, by phone, direct line, uh, via email, website. There's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Active Rain. We are, I am everywhere. I mean, you know, if you Google Ellen Davis mortgages, I'm going to pop up. I've been doing this a long time and I would love to be available just to answer questions, even if it's not in a state that I'm licensed in, if that would be helpful to your listeners. You never know. Ellen, they might know somebody in my backyard. <laughs> Ellen, I love it. And of course, all of your contact details will be posted on your show notes page, but maybe give out one website for those that are listening that want to contact you right now. Well, thank you. Perfect. Website address, www mortgagelinkhome.com that's m o r t g a g e l i n k h o m e.com that'll get you right to me love it thanks again ellen for coming on about mortgage financing options and i hope we can do it again sometime soon I look forward to it, Taylor, and thank you for the invitation, and thank you to everybody who's listening. Your podcasts are great. I love them. So thank you. You don't hear me saying it often, but if you have a mortgage-related question and you don't contact Ellen right away, then you just might as well get your head examined. You can head on over to our site for complete show notes, easy ways to follow and connect with Ellen, and more information about dealing with her fantastic mortgage business. And don't forget, if you're a homeowner agent or developer and want to showcase your properties to my listener base in over 70 countries, then I invite you to list your properties with us. Head on over to irelpodcast.com forward slash list to get started. You have been listening to the IREL Podcast with Taylor White. Be sure to hit up IRELpodcast.com for more. That's IRELpodcast.com. Thanks for listening.